The 2004 film Raise Your Voice is an inspirational coming-of-age story starring Hilary Duff as 16-year-old Terry, who attends a prestigious music program shortly after her brother's death. Although arguably the bigger tragedy is that a prestigious music program accepted somebody with such poor vocal support. <laughs> Yikes, sweetie, why do I get the feeling you were singing when your brother crashed that car? Based on a script that was originally pitched as a Christian movie, this otherwise agnostic Hillary Duff vehicle still contains overt religious symbolism and a strong sense of morality that sort of makes it feel like when your hairstylist drops hints about their Bible study group. My answer is always the same. I don't do appearances at religious events unless there's some sort of dessert table, in which case, hallelujah. So join me for a wild musical adventure full of slightly shrill vocals, a very public domain soundtrack, and a fictional school full of students and teachers so undeveloped that they probably don't even show up on security camera footage. No offense if this was one of your favorite movies as a child, kids are supposed to have bad taste. Let's see if you grew out of it in another nostalgic installment of Clip Breakdown. Ooh! La 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 la! Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other content on the web and abridge it into little baby clips so that we can look at it and say, that gets a five star rating on the billboard charts. Or, okay, that needs to be sent back to the auto-tune factory for a little bit of touchy touchy. And today we're getting into a much requested movie from all of my friends out here on the web. I knew I had to jump on this movie when Jenny Nicholson thought that this was what was coming when I covered the Britney Spears movie. I said, well, let's make that a reality. But before we get into it, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more nostalgic clip breakdowns like this. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. So turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when I'm remixing up a new tune for you, baby. Ooh, suckle on the music. I've got a merch store and a Patreon where you can access exclusive episodes of Clip Breakdown and watch parties and things like that. Anyway, it might look to the untrained eye like I only have two beverages today. Secret kombucha. He keeps me energized and he feeds my gut. You guys, this movie is a trip. As I said, it was originally pitched as a Christian project. It was also originally going to star Evan Rachel Wood and take place in New York. That got changed to LA and Hilary Duff. Let's just get into the first clip because we have a lot to look at. This is a longer movie. <laughs> It's weird to me how the studio logo for this movie uses the same CGI headlight effect that triggers the main character's car crash PTSD later in the movie. Sort of feels like they just did a copy and paste job in After Effects and said, all right, we, got, we don't have a huge budget for the CGI on this. Most of the money went to just paying Hillary herself. With an estimated $15 million budget, I would guess that like five of that went to Hilary Duff. Usually with a movie like this, when it's in production, they'll sign on with a pay or play contract where they're like, yes, I will agree to do this movie for $5 million, but if for some reason the funding falls through and we're not making the movie, you're still gonna pay me that money because I'm blocking out that period of my schedule. I'm signing on to do the project. If it doesn't get made, you need to have 5 million of that secured that I get paid regardless. So movie production, production is weird. And you can imagine in a movie like this where it's a really confined story, pretty low budget, and only one or two other known actors, at least in main roles, you can imagine they had to do a lot of production in the background. And this movie didn't even make back its budget. It made back like 10 million domestic estimated. So anyway, let's get back to the singing. Okay, you baritones need to pull way back, sounding like a gay rugby league over there. This is just choir practice, gentlemen. The auditions for Les Mis are next week. We spend an unusually long time watching them sing this song, and it's, it reminds me how far we've come in the production of music in kids' movies. Like, they would never have a whole scene dedicated to joy to the world. What is this, Sister Act 1? It feels outdated that they wouldn't have, like, a hipper song with a better vocal arrangement and a more pop-friendly, iTunes-ready kind of production production, but this was 2004. We didn't have really iTunes or streaming services to help increase the profitability of movies yet. That wasn't really a thing until later established by Disney. Joy to, joy to, joy to the world, except for that girl on the right wearing the green. She's like, how many shots of this 
song do you need? That's exactly how my sister Jillian would act when I would put her in my movies as a kid. She would be like, I mean, can you at least act like you care to be alive, sis? But for real, I feel like they scheduled a full day to shoot this number and they only needed a half. So they were like, Ugh, let's just grab a bunch of close-ups of whichever kids have the least yellow teeth. You would be forgiven as a child for just assuming that this was a Disney movie because not only is Hilary Duff in it, but at the beginning, there's also the friend from Even Stevens who plays like the nerdy kid in this movie. So it kind of gives you this Disney feel. It's not though, cause it's, it's just not up to that quality in my opinion. <laughs> Dribbled. They really give you a big info dump here at the beginning. Wow! Stop hitting on my friend! Lord, stop hitting on my brother! Just tell mom I'll be late. But it's your graduation barbecue! Really natural sounding exposition there, Frizzy McGuire. But best friend Barbara, brother Paul, it's our last day of school on the evening of a waning harvest moon. You're a Sagittarius, I'm an Aries, and our dog Coco has cataracts. Like, okay, sweetheart, he probably knows all that. Why are you talking like a robot? And I know she gives us the best friend's name there. I never cared to remember it. I'm like, Lauren? Whatever. They never give her much to do. Later at that graduation barbecue, we meet the rest of the Fletcher fam. But mostly, I really want to get into this music summer program in August. Some music thing in LA. It's Bristol Hillman Music Conservatory. Only the best summer music program on the West Coast. Plus, I already sent in my application and I sent a CD because mom said I could. That's it. You're not going. How come dad's liberal enough to wear full coverage foundation to a family barbecue, but Terry can't go to summer camp? If that actor looks familiar, it's because he played the little cowboy on Indian in the Cupboard, and he's also f***ing hot. I'm like, let's test the transfer resistance of that cream concealer on these ass cheeks, cowboy. <laughs> Also, it's a nice production detail having mom's mug have Paul's baby picture on it. The production design is not bad throughout this. I actually thought it was very believable and convincing throughout. I don't know why they're having like a graduation party with a banner and all of this, but there's nobody else at it but the aunt Nina, who's played by Rebecca De Mornay. We find out a little more about brother Paul. Nina, the prettiest girls from all the high schools go to LA. You know what happens to most of them? Yeah, they get cast in true crime reenactments for Discovery ID. It sounds awesome. Why does this guy think his daughter is going to start huffing paint and turning tricks during a four-week program to learn choral arrangement. Get it together. I grew up in the fast-paced world of show choir, okay? The worst that's gonna happen in that environment is that she'll play Never Have I Ever with some gay kids. And I promise, they're gonna be more focused on themselves, so it's not that deep. She's 16, for God's sake. What's wrong with you people? Hundreds of people apply for this. If she gets in, it's proof she belongs there, but you get that, right? But I've seen a lot more of the world than you have, Paul. The back in front of your dad's restaurant? Okay. Ooh, Paul came to read the is at the cookout. Uh, I guess that's the wit and courage that come from being a 27 year old high school senior. The older brother is such an all American good guy who stands up for what's right. I'm surprised he's even survived this long into the movie. Usually siblings this saintly start out with some sort of terminal illness. Hollywood loves a dying sister. Just think about it. Well, I can't get these damn coals to light. I'm gonna try this. My sister crowded, get in the house. Seems like that was actually what you wanted to do, but stop, yeah, don't get those perfectly staged roll rock beers warm. We're trying to sell alcohol to children here. How is there beer product placement in a movie with heavy handed Christian themes and a drunk driving accident? Seems a little tone deaf producers, but whatever you gotta get that bag. Like I said, Hillary Duff's not gonna pay herself. That night, the brother and the aunt are talking about Terry, cause it's all about Terry, even on his graduation. Look at that cross dangling in this moonlight. Dingling. <laughs> dingling cross. I'm recording this on Easter Sunday too. God bless you, Jesus. Aunt Nina, if Terry gets into that music program, we gotta make sure she goes. What's going on? Well, we're experiencing a rare solar event that's causing the atmosphere to turn blue. But don't be afraid, my child. It will all be over soon when we ascend to the great beyond. They don't, in my opinion, spend enough time establishing Terry Fletcher's musical prowess outside of these couple shots where the brother is making uh, some sort of home video that we don't know about yet. I think the reason for the limited music in this movie might be because, uh, I don't know if this is gonna offend people. Hilary Duff doesn't have a strong voice in this. She honestly doesn't have the vocals needed to carry this character. The acting is fine. She plays a shy girl well enough, but the singing, like, I just don't hear it. I can almost touch the sky. Well, what's stopping you? Reach harder, are you even trying? The camcorder is rolling, sweetheart. Are you a performer or did you get your blonde lifted three shades just to become a backup singer? The brother is always filming.
I love back then when Hilary Duff was performing a song, she would legit look like a teenager who was trying to look confident during her PowerPoint presentation. The Ottoman Empire was started in the 13th century and lasted until 1922. Every time she's on stage, Terry Fletcher is the master of cute coy singing that might be half joking. She's like, <laughs> See, where are the vocals? Also, they're officially pushing the limits of believability for sister-brother friendliness. I was close with both of my sisters when we were growing up, but if I had ever gone into the bathroom with a video camera while they were getting ready, that would be an instant screaming fight. Who would want that? And she goes, oh, hi. <laughs> I just put on a fresh pad. Hey, bro. <laughs> I just cracked myself up. <laughs> anyway, Paul edits together this mystery video that he's working on and you see him put it in the mail. What? Who? Mystery? Will that come up later? This is all happening so quick too. This is all like a single day. That's literally happening right after the fight. He just shot all of that, I guess, or he's editing it together. Yeah, he's editing it together. When Lizzie was talking to Even Stevens before she got tickets for Paul's graduation and here she gives them, but he's grounded. If you don't go, I can't go either. Please. It's three days grace. Right down to the band they go to see, all of the details of this movie feel just Christian enough to get the church camp seal of approval, but nothing is ever so blatant that it would alienate the non-Jesus heads of the crowd. Non-Jesus heads. You know how Christians call themselves Jesus heads? So the kids sneak out to the concert and the Aunt Nina's watching from the balcony like, oh, you crazy kids. Like, don't you, don't you want to get home? Anyway. Oh, by the way, this is all in Flagstaff, Arizona, and the aunt lives out in Palm Desert Cal, E, Fornia. <laughs> Finally, though, we get to the rock and rock concert scene. Music time, baby. Guitar, strumming, six strings, tuning it with my ears. Oh, oh, an ice cold bottle of beer. Beer, ooh, ooh, I tune the guitar with my ear, ear. Hey bro, help me grab my sister's ass real quick. If you have any young women in your life that you care about, you should already know not to invite strange men to grab their thighs at a concert. That's just, that's just America. That's just humanity. We don't, we don't touch the ladies. Not by surprise, not if I don't know your first, middle, and last name, but it's okay. Terry's having the time of her life. This is the concert experience we all wanted as a kid, but now watching it as an adult seems a little um, unrealistic. You know when you're the only person crowd surfing? Listen, Hillary, you're not coming down from there until we get at least one natural arm movement that somebody at a concert would make. Also, how are you gonna say this isn't a religious movie when they just reenacted the Sistine Chapel E.T. finger thing? When Adam is like, Elliot. You guys, trigger warning, car crash right now. Happening, coming at ya. Coming at ya like a car crash. <laughs> Not them finishing the cheesy rock song post-mortem. Like, uh, my brother just got plowed by a milk truck. Safe to say we were not ready for it. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? I hate that. How do they even sing that way? Are you ready for it? Yeah, that sounded, real, that sounded good to me. So sadly, Terry wakes up in a super blue hospital where it's really blue, cause we're sad. And she learns that her brother died. And yeah, that's the whole family's sad about it. No one's on the pro side of that list. It's all negative. Can you tell me your birthday? April 20th. <laughs> Blaze it. But also, sir, was it you who got hit in the head with a car recently? Did your skull just bounce off the pavement doing 40? No. I was talking to the girl in the hospital gown. Also, her birthday is only two days before my birthday. Oh! Which is this month. My birthday is April 22nd. <gasps> oh, this seems like weird timing to say it, but I did get a P.O. box. I'm not expecting you to send me anything though. I did get a P.O. box. It's in the description. Just cause some people were asking. So the doctor is like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> he doesn't literally say that. That would be me. I'd be like, so you just got an accident. What the f was that about?
Tell me what month it is out loud. Well, I can't do it telepathically, Dr. Dermablend. The men in this movie are wearing drag queen levels of face makeup, and I'm here for it. Back in 2004, most feature films were still being shot on 35 millimeter film, like actual film stock that were then being digitized and then converted to back to film when it was projected. So it has this really great filmic look, but on that film stock, you could get away with wearing much heavier makeup. You kind of needed it and it would soften everything. Everything has a little bit more of a grain to it. So it's more forgiving. Now a lot of feature films are shot on digital cameras, like red cameras. And in 4K, they get a lot more information on the skin. So people tend to wear less thick looking makeup overall, but still just an interesting thing. I love the look of film though. It's obviously beautiful. This whole movie looks really gorgeously shot. Except for that blue digital filter they put on these particular scenes. Anyway. Okay, so my official diagnosis is that she's gonna be weird about flashlights for a while. I don't know if it's a brain thing or a psychological thing, but you know, you'll figure it out. Anything that reminds Terry of headlights forevermore is uh, gonna be an issue for her until she learns to sing in public. <laughs> they kind of breeze through all the aftermath of Paul's death. Geez, I wish my brother's funeral was that quick and painless. Granted, part of the problem was because I insisted on doing a 30 minute mega mix that did put us behind schedule, but Johnny always supported my dancing. I wish I was older. So afraid I'll say something stupid and make it worse. Worse than those bone dry scrambled eggs? If Terry cooked those for you, then I think she wants you dead as well, sis. You're next. These quick little stages of grief tableaus were a little jarring for me. I was like, let me linger on the grief. I want to see the ugly tears and the crying. But whatever, Paul's dead, Paul's dead. Everyone's sad because Paul's dead. boop a doo 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 Later at the restaurant where Terry works, the mom and the aunt come up and they're like, hey, hey, we saw you got this letter about being accepted to the music program. If you want to go, you should go. We'll convince your dad. And so this is their plan to do that. Nina is helping. I'd like her to come to Palm Desert for the month of August. A month with you alone in the desert? Are you nuts? How close are you usually supervising this girl that you need to be this concerned? Is she on a life support machine that they haven't shown yet? Also, you live in Flagstaff. You should know there's not much she's going to get up to out there in the desert. Also, I don't think I've mentioned it yet, but the mother, Frances Fletcher, is played by Rita Wilson, amazing actress, COVID survivor, COVID patient zero along with her husband Tom Hanks. Remember back in March of last year everyone was like oh, a celeb got it. Terry is really unsure about going if it means she has to lie to her dad because she doesn't feel comfortable lying because she's a good girl. She's not like other girls she's a good girl. I need a good girl in my tax bracket as Nikki would say. So Nina the aunt tells a little story about dad's upbringing that helps convince Terry. He and his friend David both got football scholarships to UCLA. Neither of us wanted the restaurant. Your dad felt he had no choice but to take it. His friend David went on to UCLA and he got caught up in the LA scene. That's code for he attended a bisexual speed dating event. If your dad had taken that scholarship, he would have made it. You're right, Rebecca De Mornay. My dad is a jealous bitch. Just because he chose a life of hash browns and backaches doesn't mean the whole house has to. The dad doesn't want Terry to go to the school because his friend got caught up in the LA scene. Assuming that means like a life full of sin, like in the big city. This is where it starts to feel really Christian and moral. They're like, <gasps> Drinking a life of going out at night, not for us. We can be musicians without that. Before she leaves, mom gives Terry something to remember Paul by. He would have wanted you to have this, honey. Paul would have wanted you to have this. It's just his severed finger on a string. What if it was the entire camcorder that he was always carrying around and she was like, oh, thanks. Oh, but no, it's just that metal cross necklace that they plucked freshly from his corpse. Enjoy your flight. Um, the dad says goodbye, gives her some money. Blue, blue, blue. He thinks she's going somewhere else. Oh, she like arrives at uh, LA and someone steals her jacket right away. And it's like, that was real denim. It's supposed to show that this is a tough town, kid. Then she gets to the house and this guy won't let her in. Like, he's like, you want to come in? Bye. And it's like, what are you in charge of the school? You just are a student here what the hell this whole scene is weird to me okay i think we started off on the wrong foot i'm terry jay Ew, Jay, why are you chewing that gum so loudly? He's like, this gives the ladies a preview of what it sounds like when I eat that pussy. Why is it always shown that men in movies are romantic when they're just gatekeeping some sort of building? Like, do you come with hinges, you slab of drywall? Just because you were here first and you have a penis doesn't mean you're the 
fucking building manager, okay? Get out of the way. I'm gonna shave your hair off, yay. I don't like his hair throughout this. It's very um Ryan Cabrera. <laughs> Terry does not have a good time making friends in this school. This poor girl, <laughs> they like don't like her. It must just be because she's super cute. That's gotta be it with her middle part. Hey, I'm Terry. Uh -huh. <laughs> girl, you did not just dismiss my existence with a head full of crispy ringlets. You look like the spoiled rich girl from every Shirley Temple movie. Except for her, they always tight line your eyes for some reason and just make them look closer together. They said bad girls wear black eyeliner. Mm-hmm, that's part, that goes on the list too. For Terry, it's only clear nail polish and lip gloss and you know, mascara because she has blonde lashes. That's not very godly. So throughout the movie to maintain the lie that she's in Palm Desert when really she's in LA, she has to like three-way call with her aunt into her dad. Ugh. So that creates some, you know, mm, some drama. Well, what are you two ladies gonna do on your first big night? Oh, we're watching just eating television. dinner. Um, we're watching eating television. Dinner? Which is it? What, now they can't watch TV and eat dinner in the same night? Sometimes the dad's character is so stern that it actually prevents him from having normal reactions to things. She'll be like, I got my period. And he's like, will there be boys there? But despite all of the drama of being in a new place and not making friends right away, Terry looks up to the sky and says, hey bro. Oh, Paul, I'm here. I hope you're happy. Kill me. Oh, Paul lives in the moon now? Okay. He's symbolized by the moon because he had a telescope in his room that he always looked up at the moon with. But I think it's also just a clever way of softening some of these heavenly themes to bring them down to a more left-wing, secular level. Meet me where I'm coming to school. The next morning, uh, she's at an intro event and she sits down next to her roommate, Denise, who she only met as someone who was like, turn off the lights, I'm sleeping. Also, I don't know why she arrived so much later than everybody. Oh, she said that her train was late so but i guess everyone else at the school had plenty of time to like settle in become friends with each other oh maybe they were also there the summer before but how do they all decorate their rooms for, so fast they make her seem like she came in in the middle of this thing but whatever <laughs> Okay, kids, for your first assignment, guess which one of your teachers has the drinking problem? Or maybe Mr. Torvald is just acting crazy because he's overheating. He's got leather pants and a leather vest on top of a flannel and a thermal undershirt. Is he trying to play the cello or melt some fondue with his ass cheeks? These talented musicians beside me are your teachers, but I prefer to you to think of them as your guy. Good, since both of those words mean basically the same thing in this context. Good thing this isn't an English literature program, am I right? They lay down the stakes of the movie here at the end of the first act, or beginning of the second act, you might say. <laughs> now a lucky student will win a $10,000 academic scholarship for music study. God, I hope I get it. I hope I get it. A $10,000 scholarship for music study? Do you know how much music study you can get for that? As it so happens, Mr. Torvald and one of the other guys is Harry's teachers. They don't, we don't really meet the other teachers at all. I don't understand how these teachers are like expert musicians and vocal instructors and just like they know everything about music at once. There are five solos in the ensemble. Only five people will perform solos in front of this class. Okay, so far we've been told that hundreds of kids applied, only dozens got accepted, only one one will get the $10,000 prize and then there are gonna be five soloists. Is this a deal or no deal? Are there any more numbers we gotta crunch before someone sings a god song in this piece? I will also split you up into groups of four. Yes, I still count on my fingers. Well, I've officially lost count, guy from Sex in the City, so I'm just gonna skip all the math parts. Seems kind of superfluous anyway, if I'm honest. Also, everyone still counts on their fingers. That's not an outdated old person thing. Ugh. Some of this dialogue was clearly written by someone who stays home a lot. I love this little jam session they have out in the front of the school, which is actually a memorial school that is here in LA. They try to show us how much talent all these kids have. Why do movies always fall short on this? Like if you want us to feel like everyone in the school is musically gifted, hire some actually musically gifted kids, not just extras that you hand instruments to. <laughs> So does this school specialize in the kind of music that plays during the main menu of a Nintendo 64 video game? Also, shout out to the kid who went to a month-long music school to perfect his maraca skills. He's like, oh yeah. 
This is what I came here for. Got that wrist motion. Terry is still struggling to find her crowd. She tries to sit next to Kat Dennings, but Kat Dennings is like, okay, bye. <laughs> and even Terry's roommate, Denise, is still giving her basically no love. Should I ask for a single? Am I bothering you that much? Look, it's not even like that, all right? I'm here for that scholarship. Well, it seems really personal. Oh, please. I'm not even trying to hear that. I don't really mean nothing by it. So are we cool? Oh yes, it's super cool for a movie to include a token black character who he later finds out struggles with poverty. More on that later. For now, um, what's her name? Robin continues to be trying it. Hey, Mr. Torvald. Hey, Robin. I wanted to let you know that I tried those exercises you gave me last summer and they really helped. Now I can hit a high A, but I also noticed that my gag reflex is gone for some reason. Power of music. Also, can we help you, Terry? Peering over my shoulder like a cartoon owl? The staging is so obvious for that. And this daddy's girl look is one of the most iconic early thousands bully ensembles, if I do say so. And I will be wearing it to Pride this year, with the bra sticking out. That's the other way that they show this girl is the amoral saucy one, is like her t-shirts always showing her bra padding underneath. It's like, oh my god, she's reminding me that girls wear underwear. Hilary Duff though, always smooth and humble silhouettes, okay? Body skimming, always the shoulders are covered. It's important for her. <laughs> so she rushes to her vocal lessons with this uh, stern Russian guy. And it goes in, diaphragm goes out. Is okay to look fat. Okay, I think the body positivity coach at this school is just a little utilitarian for my taste. Again, the teacher being a perfect orchestra musician, vocal coach, songwriter, guidance counselor. Do they even tune their own pianos? That's a euphemism for inject their own insulin. This guy whose name is, why do I want to say it's something food related? Kiwi, it is something food related, Kiwi. He's trying to get Kat Denning's attention all the time with his sick drumming skills. <laughs> Why do his dirty dishes and so be lean sound like a full studio drum kit? And was he eating pasta with grapes and ham slices? Mm -mm. We need to check this kid's backpack. I don't like the looks. Next, Terry is out and about on the LA scene. Yes, we live for Terry's candy ho t-shirt look. That's what I call myself on a late night run to 7-Eleven. It's also the name of a famous Puerto Rican drag queen who was on Drag Race. I don't know how no one caught that. I don't know what the shirt really says, candy shoes maybe, but it just always says candy ho. Oh, in this scene, Terry actually goes to the church and prays and then touches her cross and then leaves. So she's super Jesus-y. You know, this movie is very religious. It's funny, I like when I first watched this, closer to when I was like 13, when it came out, I don't think I noticed how religious it was because that was closer to when I was actually raised Catholic. Like we went to church on Easter and stuff. So it kind of just felt like the standard, like, oh yeah, everyone goes to church and thinks about that kind of thing. No. Also you guys, I'm using Fenty powder foundation right now. Do we love the way my skin looks? I think it looks great. I think it's couture. Mm, 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 mm. Mm. Does it match my hands? Yeah. So she gets clocked by, what's his name? What's the guy's name? I can't remember what the boyfriend's name is. We'll get it. She sees a penny on the street and she flips it over so that it's heads up. It isn't lucky unless it's face up. Oh, there must have been a downward facing penny somewhere on the night of your brother's death. Guess you learned that one the hard way, didn't you? Jay is his name and Terry are talking about their lives a little bit, although it stops short of Terry getting to really share her trauma. Me and my brother were in a car accident. Some drunk driver ran through a red light and- Hey Terry, come here. Uh, look, Terry, I've, I've got to go. I've, I've got to meet somebody. Oh, okay. You could probably tell that my story wasn't going anywhere, I guess. Just about this crazy night I had once, but yeah, go ahead and grind on the popular chick. Love ya. So Denise brings Terry along a little bit and they finally start to warm up to each other. He likes to hit on nice girls. And baby, you, you got a lock on that one. You like some kind of retro Brady puncher. Shoot, I'm not even trying to hear that. Sweetie, you've had a black friend for all of 30 seconds. This is really how you want to play it. Terry's the girl who's like, since I have you as a roommate, can I finally start wearing my dashiki? So Denise brings Terry into Union Station, which is train station where she starts playing her violin, but she has this foot pedal that adds some weird echoey noise to it, which is supposed to make it sound like really innovative. Like, oh my God, she's good at what she does. But you know, Terry's always trying to fool her dad. So he's like calling him are at surprise times and they have to do the three-way calling thing. All of that rigmarole. Meanwhile, Terry is showing us that she's not fully present in her classes. King of kings. Oh, I think 
that some of us maybe need to practice this a little bit more outside of class. And I think some of us need to shop a size up on the screen printed baby doll tees, okay? Over there looking like an overstuffed reading chair. It's funny how in this movie it's kind of hard to tell when Terry's singing poorly versus when she's singing like really good at the end. It all kind of sounds to me. I think it's really important for Hilary Duff to have songs that are produced to fall within her vocal range, and this movie clearly did not. These songs were not necessarily made for her, because a lot of them are just standard, like, hymns. Mr. Torvald is like, where is the girl that we saw on that DVD that you sent in? And she's like, what are you talking about? I didn't send in a DVD. And he's like, sure you did. Look. Which doesn't make sense. I did not send it. I really have no idea what you're talking about. No? Well, maybe you'll be inspired. I know we were. Terry's my sister. And uh, she's my favorite person in the whole world. She likes a challenge. She thrives when she's pushed. How was it not clear that Terry didn't send this? Her brother is literally telling you that up front on his way to being killed by a car. They thought Terry just sent in an extra audition tape much later from the point of view of her older brother in order to be, what, narratively compelling? Also, can we talk about the weird way that 20-something actors try to talk when they're playing someone in their teens? I've seen it on so many episodes of Law & Order SVU where it's like some guy being like, wait, I gotta go. Oh, hey, yeah, sure, I could talk to you. I just gotta go and study before I hit the the practice team. Oh, hey, detective. Yeah, sure. You guys figure out what's going on with my ma yet? Like, that's not how even young people talk. You're just not closing your mouth all the way, I guess. But obviously seeing your brother like this is putting Terry through it. <laughs> hey, Terry. He's like, how come every time I try to inspire my young female students, they run out of my office crying? Are my shoulder massages too firm or something? <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you how to organize a suitcase, but I think if you stopped and took a deep breath, you'd see that the only thing this hysterical packing is going to accomplish is leaking teen spirit body spray all over your clothing. Jay comes in and convinces her to stop packing for a minute. Come on, let's just get out of here. The bag isn't walking away. How do I know you won't? Oh, abandonment issues. Listen, I will try my best to never get killed in a car accident, but that's the most I can promise at this point. We just met. So Terry and Jay are out walking in Santa Monica, and he says, no, me and Robin are not really a thing. She just doesn't want to let go. Which is like, okay, but why are you kissing her at the beginning of this movie? Just curious. Like, is she not letting go, or are you not specifically telling her it's over? Um, I'm curious but we never really get into those flaws from this character because, you know, we really don't get much development from any of the other characters outside of Terry. But that's okay, because the next day we're singing, we're singing, and this is one iconic scene that I just, it lives rent-free in my head, of course. La 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 Brava. That's the sound an angel would make when she queeps. I've been trying to master this vocal run for weeks, so let me see if I finally got it. I can't believe I'm just as good as Terry Fletcher. <laughs> I saw a total of two comments on my channel lately saying that it's so cringy when I sing. Mama, it's cringy when she sings. You got a problem with me? Would you have a problem with Tony award-winning Patti Lapone singing? Cause it's just as good. <laughs> my singing is just as good. If you don't like my singing, you ain't here to party. Ladies, gentlemen, there's a fire on the roof, a fire on the roof. Hit the fast forward 10 seconds button. That's what it's there for. Cause you can never stop me from doing my heart song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how she sounds in every song of this. Like, girl, are you a cartoon mouse singing? Later on, Jay and her sit down and Jay is like a great songwriter, but not a good lyricist. So she helps put lyrics to the words. This is something that we've seen happen again in like Camp Rock too. A bunch of musical movies do this where it's like, you write the music and I write the lyrics. Lifetime does this a lot, Hallmark does this. A lot of music movie cliches happening here. Play something for me. Sing to me, Paolo. So they're building their relationship through music. Meanwhile, Terry is more of the good girl when she goes and brings people together because Kiwi likes Kat Denning's character and Terry invites 
Kat Dennings to a party thing. <laughs> we were wondering if you wanted to come hang out with us on Saturday night. Why would he have a crush on me? That's stupid. Yeah, you're not supermodel hot or anything with the lips of a goddess. Kat Denning is always playing these characters who would be having men fall at their feet if it were real life, just based on her appearance. She's gorgeous. We learn a little bit more about Denise. She, her mom owns a clothing store and designs cool stuff. And she, again, is poor. I mean, even with me working part-time, bagging groceries, and you know, doing what I can street performing, we still had crazy trouble scraping up the tuition. What's that sound? Oh, it's this girl winning the scholarship at the end because she deserves it the most. Of course they have to have one of the only characters of color be disadvantaged because why challenge viewers with new storylines instead of just stereotypes? Next we have this rather long scene where she's like, your dad's coming to visit you in the desert. You have to come out here now. So she gets on the train and just barely makes it to see him in time. So they keep the ruse going just a little bit longer. Literally nothing funny happens or new or interesting happens there. So I just ignored it. <laughs> and then that night they go out um, on Saturday and hang out as a big group and sing another song. Never heard the song in my life. You gotta smile so bright. You know you could have been a cancer. What in the preschool birthday party playlist? Why is everything they do in this movie the kind of music your Sunday school teacher would swear is just as good as what they play on the radio? They're like, let's all rock out. Ave Maria. But apparently the whole town just eats it up when they sing this. This is Hillary Duff singing that. You know you smile so bright. You know you come in and like she always looks so meek doing it. She's like, like none of this is good, Mama. I'm sorry. The way you do, the things you do. The way you do, the things you do. She said, here you go, Denise. I'm helping you collect money like a poor person. Ouch, I'm hungry. <laughs> this just reinforces that all it takes to get noticed in society is being a cute young white girl, dead or alive. At this point, Jay and Alexandria, <laughs> Terry, are full on dating because they're kissing each other in the hallways. They're singing together, making beautiful tunes. And then they go to this um, event at night, which I think they clearly needed to add in some extra dialogue to make us aware of what it is. Night, guys. Hey, it's open mag night, guys. Nobody's mouth moved in a way that would have them be saying that. Maybe it was ADR, maybe it was just Paul's ghost commenting from heaven like, yeah, tear it up, sis. We'll never know, because they won't admit to this being a religious movie, even though she's wearing a cross around her neck every scene. Terry gets pretty much forced to go up on stage and sing open mic, and something triggers her. <laughs> Me, after my voice cracked during the understudy performance of Aida, I honestly went home and Googled how to recover from a public relations disaster. Terry expresses she just wasn't ready, blue, blue, blue. Meanwhile, Robin is super frustrated later that um, day. Terry is all worn out and sad. She's mourning her brother's death. And then Robin is having a jealous fit about the solo. I deserve this part. <laughs> Well, I guess you have a new favorite now. The teacher is like, what can I say? She seems more virginal and doesn't show as much skin. You're lucky we don't stone you to death right here in this rehearsal room. Kissing boys and wearing eyeliner on the bottom? Mm-mm, Mary Magdalene. Mr. Torvald basically gives Terry a talking to for missing rehearsal and she's like, I'm feeling better now. And he's like, wow, you must not want to do the work. Meanwhile, Robin is seducing Jay and, he, and she kisses him non-consensually right as Terry comes into the room. So that's of course sends her a run in. I'd be knocking at the door like, Terry, sweetheart, a girl who cries as much as you would love the softness and strength of new Puffs Plus tissues with lotion. You can't scour away your eye bags with those hand towels forever. You sad, tear-stained piglet. Hillary's acting coach was working this whole movie. She had to cry a lot. As a tormented artist who just ruined his chances, Jay is playing piano. Hillary has her bangs snatched back into that early thousands poof that we loved so much. She got those bangs off the forehead so she could cry with all of her strength. Mr. Torvald starts to comfort her. I just can't let this go. Can someone let her know that it's okay to not be completely over her brother's death from two months ago? Like, I feel like she needs an actual therapist right now and all these teachers are like, um, do you know the Do Re Mi song? Do, a dear, your brother is dead. Ray, your mother's favorite son. <laughs> and then that night, Jay comes in drunk, you guys. That's ungodly. Ugh. Shut up! 
You shut up! She was kissing me. Oh, no, he didn't even try to go there. Please. I'm sure that makes a lot of sense, Jay, when you're drunk. Just because this is such a serious topic, I feel like now would be a good time to make a public service announcement that this movie is kind of boring. Everyone should watch it because it's iconic, but it's like one church song away from being a Jesus movie, and we all need to recognize that. Also, it's crazy how Robin really did kiss him without his consent, but he's never believed just because he's a man and he's drunk in this moment. That's a problem. When later, the same thing happens to a woman and it's also not a problem. So what the hell? The early thousands was nuts. So that he doesn't get in trouble, Terry brings Jay up onto the roof where she sits sometimes to look at the moon. And then the next morning they wake up together and it's all kind of forgiven. Like, girl, did you just stand on the roof all night? That's crazy to me. I would never. I'd be like, I'll come back in the morning. Don't jump. But I guess that's why she stayed. You can't leave a drunk person on the roof. He'll fall off. <sighs> but anyway, he's forgiven. They are working on a song together. Oh, but at home, the dad sees an invitation to this end of the year performance. So this cat's out of the bag. I kind of wish they had cloaked this a little bit and just don't shown him like getting the mail or shown something at the school where the guy, the teacher is like, so I just sent out all of those parent invitations. And then we are like, uh oh, that might be bad. But we get this instead. Lied to me? Did you hear you me? and Our Nina? daughter got into the best music school in the country. All of you lied to me. All of you. Not everything has to be about you, sir, okay? Plaid shirts and anger issues are your thing. Let your daughter have music camp just one month out of the year. They try to give us a satisfying wrap up to the storyline with Kiwi and Kat Dennings. Um, it's not good. You are the loudest, noisiest, rudest jerk on the planet! Don't worry, in the early thousands, it was considered consensual as long as the man who initiated it was a musician. This cliche of an angry outburst leading to a passionate kiss sends a dangerous message to straight men everywhere. And they're already really bad at reading the emotional temperature of any room. If we're at the point where I'm raising my voice, I'm not horny, I'm yelling. I'm yelling at you. I'm an angry human. But later we're at the final event, the final jam, if you will, um, where it's the talent show and that guy Kiwi is showing us more of his music talents. She doesn't even know! She's really good. Let's not forget to mention how much of Raise Your Voices storyline was borrowed by Camp Rock. You can practically see Mitchie's little bangs peeking around the corner looking for ideas. Terry is like, oh, my cross isn't on right before she's about to go perform. So she runs out to get it because she needs Paul with her for her performance, which like, no, you don't. And right when she gets back to her room, she sees, uh-oh, her dad's here. Again, I feel like the dad being in the room would have been a much more of a surprise if we never saw him get the letter. And then we'd be like, oh my God, this is totally undercutting like the excitement of her about to perform. And then she has to give this emotional speech being like, this has been the hardest, most challenging thing of my life. And if you take me away, I'll die. And like, basically I would just love to have you and mom supporting me. The mom is in the car, by the way. I think it was a weird move of the dad to be like, we're gonna go pick her up right now. And like minutes before her performance, like at that point, you literally might as well stay and watch her perform. Nobody would be like, no, you stayed for all these four weeks and now I'm not gonna let you have the harmless performance that literally would just traumatize you if I made you leave. Like this feels a little artificial, but it's not for nothing. We get this beautiful, song at the end. This feels like the part of the concert where I know that it's okay to start heading to the parking lot. I really didn't expect this movie to come covered in such a generous helping of gospel gravy, but hey, at least it's keeping things moist. Like they legit have the stained glass of windows behind her in this performance. No, I won't break down. It's time for them to announce who won. Please to present this scholarship to Denise Gilmore. <laughs> Way to go, Denise. No one is allowed to be sad they didn't win. She needs the help. Congratulations. We know how much you needed that. It seems like this whole musical performance really turned the dad around. And now I can hardly even remember that brother's death. We hope uh, we see you next year. Well, you just might. Although there's an equal chance that I completely snap over the school year and put up a barbed wire perimeter around the house. And therefore, what is the deadline on getting that deposit back? We end with one more riveting performance by Hilary Duff. <laughs> Heart, but I'm not gonna cry. 
All right, now that the movie's over, can she relax her arms? She's had that tennis elbow elevated for like the whole third act. My heart won't crumble, my heart won't crumble. Yeah, I'm not gonna cry. These are her arms the whole time. Hillary, settle down. <laughs> I love this movie for how kind of bad it is. Like she did not have the stage presence or the vocal performance to pull off this character, but you know I love me some Hillary Duff, so I'm not complaining that they chose her over, you know, an actual singer. Maybe if they had just crowded in the extras with really talented kid musicians and I don't know, given us some better original music that kids actually want to listen to, then it would have felt a little more relatable, but you guys seem to really love this movie so let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Do you feel like it holds up? Also, let me know what movies I should cover next on Clip Breakdown. Give this video a big thumbs up. It really helps support this channel. But most importantly, if you're new here, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, turn on notifications, and you'll always be the first to know when I'm serving up a fresh new song from the Church Bug. Also, I've got merch available and a Patreon where you can access exclusive Clip Breakdown episodes and virtual watch parties and more. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for raising your voice with me today. I will see you guys next time. Mwah!